You're listening to Beyond the Measure, episode 15. Listen as I, a young composer, and my wife, a young choir director, interview other music educators in order to gain insight into their own success in the classroom. We have a lot to learn, and we want you to learn with us. No matter your age, ensemble, or experience, this is the ideal podcast for music educators, composers, and students alike. So join us as we go beyond the measure. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's episode of Beyond the Measure. I am your host, Christian, here with my beautiful co-host. It's me, Kara. Yes. How are, <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing today, Kara? I'm doing great. I'm tired. I started um, new teacher orientation, all that fun stuff this week, so it was very, very busy, but exciting stuff. Busy, busy time. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, today we do not have a guest on the podcast, but we do have kind of a uh, a little bit different, kind of more, I was going to say more fun, but (laughs) I mean, it's not not necessarily more fun, but... uh, Uh, Resourceful. Yes, resourceful. That's that's a good word for it. So we just made a little list of different tools that we think could be helpful to any music educator. Um, These aren't necessarily your... uh, these are the more physical technological uh, side of things so these are just kind of little things that might be able to help make your job easier uh, or kind of help you in certain aspects um, of the uh, the teaching experience I guess you could say so we're just going to kind of go down the list and um, again these aren't I mean, these are just ones that we have found that we that we like to use um, or that we think would be helpful just from our own experiences. Um, but um, obviously, this uh, we, we encourage you to go out and look for your own uh, your own different things that would be helpful to you because there is so much out there these days. Um, and if you know of any tools that you think uh, we should know about, uh, feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, my email is Christian at Christian Fortner Music dot com. And um, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, so first thing that we have on our list is something that I used pretty frequently throughout my first year and even like at the beginning. Um, Teachers pay teachers. You probably know about it, Um, but it has so many resources for not even just music educators, but just educators, period. Like there's stuff ranging from PK all the way up until 12th grade, all different types of contents. Um, um, So... I know we're all kind of thinking about mm, what do we want our, our rooms to look like? What kind of aesthetic are we wanting if you're that kind of teacher? Um, they have things like decorative things. Like I, I bought some Soulfetch hand signs, like posters off of there for very cheap. Um, and also after, you know, all the, they have so many different things. Like there's decorative stuff and um, there's also just like, lesson plans. I would, I'll say I use teachers pay teachers the most whenever I was in a bind. So if I woke up sick during the night and I was like, oh man, I definitely do cannot go to school tomorrow. Um, I would go on teachers pay teachers, look up emergency sub plans, you know, like specific to what I teach. And I would find something, look through it, purchase it, like maybe $2. And all I have to do for prep is upload it to Google Classroom and it is there for my students to use. Really easy. Um, You don't have to stress at 3 a.m. of like building a sub lesson plan. Like it's already there for you. Yeah. And that's just one of the many different things that's available on there. Yeah. Um, And just to clarify, in case you're not familiar with Teachers Pay Teachers, as you can kind of tell from the name, it's stuff that teachers have made um, that have put up there for sale that you as a teacher can buy. So it is quite literally that teachers paying teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, you're uh, you're probably getting even better materials than you would get just from some random, I don't know, person on Etsy that may not actually have any experience in the teaching world. Um, And then the other thing I wanted to mention too, is from what I can tell from when you've used it, most of that stuff is pretty affordable, right? Oh yeah. Um, you know, all like the if the little things, I think the most expensive thing that I've purchased was maybe $25, but mm-hmm. that's rare. It's usually around like the $1 to $10 range. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and this is one of those items on the list that it's not even just for music teachers that it's helpless. Yeah. Literally any any kind of teacher, it doesn't matter what kind of teacher you are, you're going to be able to find stuff on here that's that's really helpful for you. So, all right, number two on the list is GarageBand or some sort of free audio software like Audacity. Uh, that's another popular one you may have heard of. Um, but these are really good just for the sake of putting together recordings or even just making recordings. Um, it's again, I, I should reiterate the biggest thing about these is that they're free, but they work really, really well. This isn't just like some random little thing you, you, you know, you would find on the internet and it does a little bit for you and that's it. No, like, I mean, GarageBand, if you have a Mac, uh, an Apple product or even an iPad, uh, you can put in MP3 files in here um, and edit those. You can, you know, cut them up however you need to or put in fades um, stuff like that or if you're needing to record practice tracks on your own um, that's something you can do as well so you can always record yourself singing one line uh, and you can also have the click track as well uh, record yourself singing one line and then you can go back and record the second line mute the other track and do all of that with the exact same metronome so that you know they're all going to be lined up um, and so then you have your individual recordings of tracks um, but then if you wanted to, you can also put them all together if need be as well. Um, this also goes for accompaniment tracks. Uh, so you can uh, put in whether it's a live recording you do or you get like even just like a MIDI recording, you can also plug that in. Um, so just a lot of really good and accessible stuff you can do, um, not just on the vocal side, but again, any, anywhere in the, in the music area uh, could be really helpful for you. Yeah, and another fun fact is that we edit our podcasts on GarageBand. So... Um, I think the quality of our of the way it sounds, I think it sounds pretty good for, you know, using like a cheap, a free software on your computer. So. Yeah, exactly. And I'll just say for GarageBand specifically, I mean, so Apple is, are the creators of the uh, digital audio workstation Logic, which is literally one of the most uh, professional, most well-known um, things that, you know, like movie composers use and audio engineers and everything and GarageBand is literally just a free version of Logic. So you're you're basically getting to use um, one of the most professional types of um, audio recording software um, but just in a slightly lesser uh, you know free version. Okay next up is probably my favorite thing on this list um, Canva. So Canva is a website an application um, that is basically for like has a lot of templates for design um you can make programs choir programs band orchestra programs for your concert um along with if you, have, if you run a social media account for your um for your program uh you can just make all of your designs and all of your posts on canva um and so a really, really great thing about it. Okay, so there's already a free version uh, for anybody to use, but there's a premium um, that you have to pay for. However, it is free for teachers to use um, if you like have a verified valid teacher certification. Um, so I used that all last year. So you, I got to use all of the premium things that I wouldn't be able to use if I didn't have premium. Um, and so... Now in my in my new school district, they already like pay for Canva for everybody. So it's going to be the same thing, but it's great that I can just make everything, all designs and pro brochures and other things with Canva. Yeah. And we should also mention that I guess where we designed our podcast cover art yes. on Canva. Canva. And um, actually, the main image we used was actually from a different site, but we still designed mm -hmm. the look of it with the font and, and put the picture on there and yeah. everything on Canva. And uh, you can resize images and everything so you can have it fit whatever size paper or poster you're looking to do. So yeah, it works well for that social media, um, but it also works well if you're wanting to um, make like a poster to, you know, put up in the hallways of your school, um, advertising for a concert, um, or just some sort of event you're doing, or like Kara said, for like your program, can you design the actual entire program on there? Do you think, or is it, do you think more just for like the cover? of the program? No, I, you can design. It's something that not, I've not really done. I did it for a college project. 
um, okay. two years ago, but they have like all these different templates that you could use just like we were talking about. Um, and this is like not teacher related, but we used Canva for um, like our, the programs for our wedding. Um, so it works really great. Okay, number four is musictheory.net. Um, I hope anybody listening to this has heard of it, but if for some reason you have not, um, it is a website online that you can access for free, and it is just chock full of music theory lessons and exercises. Um, again, it's completely free to use. There might be a premium version, I don't know, but I just know that the free version has more than enough, uh, especially you know on a you know middle high school level or, or even elementary. Um, you can go in and you can kind of set the difficulty of the exercises, and so you can choose something like uh, rhythm or pitch recognition or intervals, um, stuff like that. And that is something that is super helpful for you know whether you're choir, band, orchestra, um, or even theater. I mean. Uh, being able to just really exercise and strengthen your theory and oral skills. Um, this is also really good for, uh, you know, you could use this to have like extra credit assignments or an alternative assignment if for some reason maybe a student um, can't make a concert or, or some sort of event, that kind of thing. Uh, very, very easy to do with that. So that's something I highly recommend, especially as, um, you know, it, it can be hard to be able to have enough time in class to, to do a, to focus a whole lot on music theory. Um, and so this is always a good thing you can use to be able to still get students to familiar that familiarize themselves, uh, themselves with uh, the theory side of things. Okay. The next one, um, I've personally have not used it, but, um, we, uh, like a couple days ago, we put out on Facebook on like these different choir director, band director groups, um, what are some resources that they've used that have found, found helpful? And so one um, commenter put um, rhythmrandomizer.com. So um, the the name, or the, the website handle is literally what it is. It's a rhythm randomizer. So it gives, um, you literally type in rhythmrandomizer.com and it automatically has like a two to four measure rhythm. Um, and so I think this might be like an easy way to, um, incorporate some rhythm exercises at the beginning of class, maybe like as a warm up or transitioning into sight reading and stuff like that. Um, you do maybe two to four of these and you just hit new rhythm every time there's every time you're done and it also has a metronome on it. So, yeah, that's kind of a good thing that you compare with the music theory.net yeah. type thing of, just being able to practice rhythms and, and stuff like that. I don't know if you could do clapping or even doing it on a syllable or something mm -hmm. like that. So very good. All right. Number six, this one is going to seem very, very obvious and self-explanatory, but we still wanted to point it out just because it's important not to forget and not take for granted the tools you have at your disposal for free. Uh, and so this one is YouTube slash any sort of audio or video recording. Uh, and again, it may seem like, well, yeah, duh, but it's important to remember that, you know, being able to expose your students to um, not just one, but many different uh, performances of the same piece can be very, very helpful uh, to them in being able to see just what's possible uh, whenever you put your mind, uh, you put your mind to it, um, and and really work on on you know whatever it is you're focusing on that day in class, and um, you can kind of throw up a recording and, and show them, hey, look, we can get and be and get to this if we work on this here right now. Um, now, obviously, sometimes you got to be careful because you don't want them to hear a bad recording and then start mirroring. <laughs> um, or a good know. one. Like maybe sure. you want them to sound a certain way and maybe, you know, the choir that you are recording, like that you're listening to is maybe a bit too mature. You know, yeah. like you don't want to set like unrealistic unrealistic expectations for them sure and also like in regards to like tempo and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but i still think overall it's um it's a really really helpful thing for your students to be able to hear and see that wow there are first of all there are a bunch of other people out in the world that do this and sound good and i'm a part of that legacy as well yeah and, and there's also just different type of like t teaching resources i would pull up like um rhythm like clapping rhythms to popular songs on the radio um, that 
teacher like choir teachers or band teachers music teachers made already and so sometimes rhythm uh exercises can be very boring but if you put it into the context of um like pop culture and what's relevant to them it makes it much more exciting like I remember whenever Encanto was very very popular last year um there was a we don't talk about Bruno um clapping one so that one was really fun yeah and And they really enjoyed it yeah and another way you can use YouTube to your advantage as well is that um you can use it as an archive for all of your concert recordings um obviously you know, actually posting them publicly is kind of iffy nowadays with the way, uh, you know, people are handling copyright and, you know, digital rights and stuff like that. But you can always list all, make a YouTube channel and list all of the recordings as unlisted or private, which means that only you or people that have the link, the direct link to that video are able to view. So it's not something that's just going to be out there for anyone to be able to see. And so you could always easily use that um, to, you know, send to parents or, or students that want to hear the recording. Okay. Number seven. Um, this is probably one of the most expensive things on the list. <laughs> one of the few non-free things on yes. this list. <laughs> um, but an iPad or a tablet of some sort. So, um, if you're lucky, I mean, I think most school districts now, um, provide you with like a school device, uh, whether that's a Chromebook, um, an iPad, along those lines. But if you want your own personal tablet or iPad, I would highly encourage you um, to save up and get one. Uh, that's what I did. I just purchased my um, iPad. What is it? iPad Pro. Yeah. Um, and it's a 12.9 inch one. Um I don't have my own personal device, so I've been using, me and Christian have been sharing his um, laptop for quite a while. Um, So this was kind of necessary for me, but I've already found it to be really, really resourceful. Um, There's so many different applications for um, note-taking and um, like score, like note-taking. So one app that I just purchased um it's called four score um and it's specifically for um sheet music so in four score you can um import diff- uh, like all your sheet music so you can have it on your ipad and to go beyond that you can write like write on it so they have pins and highlighters and different other things that you can do to um, mark your score and it's really great. I'm excited to use it this year um, for not only just um, teaching but I'm in multiple ensembles outside of work and just having one binder or or just like one place for all of my music for everything that I'm in is going to be nice instead of having like three different binders for all my ensembles. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm excited for that. Um, I haven't used it that much, but I will say it is $20 for the app to purchase. But after that, everything else, there's no in purchases in within the app, if that makes sense. Um, and then the other app that I'm going to be using, um, one of my colleagues told me about this the other day, is called Planbook. Um, most school districts require for you to um, put in um and submit lesson plans. And so Planbook is an app that I found it's more of a time saver than anything. Um, so you can put in you know, your content, what you're teaching, your classes, like how many classes you're doing, um, and what state you're living in. So whenever it pulls up, you know, the standards, it you just scroll through the teaks, find the one, boom and then it's in your lesson plan so it's basically a template that they've used like they that they made for you to put in your lesson plans um and so you just boom send them in and i'm excited to use this as well i think this one is 12 dollars a month but it'll be easy to save time yeah and that's that's the biggest thing i think to remember in regards to all of this it, well in regards to the ipad the, the more pricey items specifically i mean everyone's in a different financial situation so obviously like 
this item isn't a necessity, right. but it's something that helps a lot. And so if you're one of those people that maybe you could you could afford it if you saved up a little bit and you're just kind of debating whether it's worth it. The thing is with something like an iPad, there are a lot of little things that are made much more easy to do that over time ends up doing a lot for you. Um, one thing I'm just thinking of right off the bat is the fact that if you get the, uh, the pencil that you can mm. use the Apple pencil to mark on the iPad, it magnetizes to the side of the iPad and charges it and, and it charges the pencil when it's magnetized to it. And like, that's just, it may not seem like much, but like when you're there at the piano and you're walking and you're teaching your students and you know, you don't want to lose track of where your pencil's at or trying to find one or it falling off your ear or something like that, uh, depending on where you put it, you can just right there and then grab it and put it right back. That's just one of many little things that can, uh, that can help with, uh, with that sort of thing. Um, but I think the main thing to think about is that it is an investment. Um, yes. yeah, it is, it is a good bit of money, right? right up front but think about how much time and how much effort it's going to save you down the road yes and i i I know we already disclaimed it but please don't think that we're like you need to have an ipad to be successful yeah of course (laughs) not um i mean and of course if you're just like a traditional person who wants paper Mm -hmm. that's fine too um but if you are looking for a concise place to have yeah. all your music and maybe save sp- some paper or whatever, this would be a good option for you. That was the other thing I was going to mention is it saves time and space. Yes. Let us take a quick break real quick so I can tell you a little bit about this podcast's primary sponsor, which is Christian Fortner Music. That's right, my own music business. This is the primary platform that I use to sell my music, and you can uh, find it at www.christianfortner, that's F-O-R-T-N-E-R, music.com. Now, you may be thinking, oh, I don't know, this guy is a young composer. Does he really know what he's doing? Well, (laughs) to be honest, none of us composers really know what we're doing if if we're being completely honest with ourselves. But if you want to kind of get an idea of what my music might be like and if it might be a good fit for your ensemble, you can actually uh, get a free copy of music from me. That's right, a free piece of music. This isn't just a study score. This is a full score and parts that you can use for your ensemble to perform completely for free. And you can do that by signing up for my mailing list. So if you go to my website, Christian Fortner, that's F-O-R-T-N-E-R, music.com slash mailings, You can sign up for my mailing list right there and you'll get a link in your inbox where you can select a piece of music for either choir, string orchestra, or band. And I should also mention that the choir piece, it can be either an SAB, SA, or TB version. So uh, for any of you out there that are looking for SAB, SA, TB, specific voicings like that, then this might be a good opportunity for you. Uh, So yeah, that's about it. Again, if that's something you'd be interested in, just check it out on my website. And now we can get back to the episode. Okay, the next tool is a free one, so don't worry. We're we're done with the expensive. That's probably it's got to be the most expensive yes, tool on is. our list. In fact, that might be the only one on our list that actually requires a cost, purchase. Cost except- more than a little bit of money. <laughs> um, there's like one or two others that like maybe cost a little bit of money, but most of these are free, really cheap. Yeah. Um, MuseScore. If Again, for some reason you haven't heard of MuseScore, you got to check this thing out. So um, MuseScore is a completely free notation software and it's good. Um, This is like Sibelius or Finale, which I'm sure you've heard of, but free. Um, Obviously, I'm I'm sure there are a few things that maybe it doesn't have that Sibelius or Finale do have. Um, This isn't, I don't think this is what you know, the official professional engravers use on their scores, but MuseScore is up and coming uh, and it's been doing that for a while. It is very, very good. Um, It looks nice. It's easy to use to input um, notes on the staff. It's completely customizable. I mean, you can literally create basically whatever type of music you want on there. So this would be great for creating your own rhythmic exercises, sight reading exercises, uh, recording warm-ups uh, on there, uh, whatever you're needing it for. It's pretty easy to figure out. And again, you can always just find out how to do it online if you're not sure how to do something. But I think it's pretty intuitive. Um, that's actually what I started composing on when I was in high school since I couldn't afford Sibelius or Finale at the time. Um, and I wrote my earliest compositions on there, and it was great. Um, it does have your MIDI sounds on there. They're 
definitely not the best, but they're definitely not the worst either. And the piano one itself is actually very good. In fact, I'm, I think I might even like the MuseScore default piano more than the Sibelius one uh, or Finale. So that's also something to consider if you're needing a short little quick um, piano MIDI file, uh, audio recording to use for anything last minute, you can easily plug that in, export the audio as an MP3, boom, you have it. So very, very good tool. I highly recommend doing um, and again, you can export everything to PDF, print those out, and hand them out to your students. Yeah, and um, s like kind of going back to, you said you started with MuseScore mm -hmm. whenever you were a high school student. Yep. So if you have any students in your classroom who are wanting to, um, you know, maybe they want to compose music or anything, like mm -hmm. this is, a, mm -hmm. I think that might be the best place for them to start is MuseScore since it is free and um, easy to use. Exactly. And that's another way that you can connect to those music theory assignments if you want to do anything music related. Or you could also do that as an assignment. If there's a student that's interested in composition, you can say, all right, well, here's your assignment. Write a 16 measure uh, piece with, you know, one line uh, in the treble clef and one line in the bass clef. And, and see what you can do with that. And that's just an easy way. It, I don't think it takes up a whole lot of space on your computer either. So it shouldn't be too hard for most students to, uh, to get a hold of. So number nine, um, a music staff for your whiteboard. So um, if you don't have, I think most colleges have like a whiteboard. Most colleges that have, have one. Like, this, like the five lines mm -hmm. already on there. But um, if you don't have that at your school, um, using some tape like on your whiteboard to make just five lines, four spaces. So that's like an easy way for you to point to um, and for easy for your students and you to visualize um, the notes on the staff. Yeah, and again, remember it saves time because if you ever need to illustrate how something looks on the staff, you don't have to draw out five lines and then write the notes the lines are already there on the whiteboard for you. If you go back to episode five, when we interviewed Dr. Bernard Scher, uh, we actually talked about the importance of having a staff on your whiteboard and how it's really is integral to being able to con have, having your students connect all of the dots visually uh, and also like from what they're hearing and all that. Yes, or you can do a good old hand staff. Yeah, good old hand staff, but <laughs> that might take a while. Um, but yeah, you can find, I think, really uh, pretty, much, pretty affordable like little certain kind of special black strips of tape on Amazon. Uh, we'll link uh, something that we think would work uh, in the description uh, that you can get on Amazon and just use that and use a meter stick or something and, and put it all on there. And it might take a little while uh, to put up on your, st on your uh, whiteboard, but once you got it up there, it's going to be more than worth it. Okay. Number 10, we have my score and arrange me. This is not a sponsor or anything like that. This is actually something we did just want to recommend uh, when it comes to selecting repertoire. Um, I'm sure a lot of you listening are familiar with MyScore and ArrangeMe at this point, uh, but in case you haven't heard of it, uh, MyScore is done by J.W. Pepper and ArrangeMe is done uh, by uh, Hall Leonard. Uh, and I say ArrangeMe, but it's also technically Sheet Music Plus, which you might have heard of. Um, these are platforms where um, people are able to upload their original compositions and GW Pepper uh, and Hall Leonard sell them uh, for you. And so uh, the composers still get some of the royalties, um, but they you know, are easily able to handle all of the distribution and printing and shipping and all of that stuff since you know, they know what they're doing. Um, and the reason we wanted to point this out is because if you are looking for new repertoire um, and you just kind of want maybe something different or you're just wanting to look in a new place, you haven't really... Um, other than like the main primary catalogs of the big publishers, you might look at my score and sheet music plus because that is going to be chock full of original music that maybe hasn't gotten a lot of performance, but it's still really good quality and is easy to order in the same way that you would at any of these other publishers. Um, I really wanted to point that out as a composer myself too, because I'm a big proponent of that being able to perform uh, young and new composers music. Uh, this is a really good way to do that. Yeah. And, um, also, I feel like a lot of our budgets are very, very, like supply budgets are mm -hmm. very small um, and music is expensive. And I feel like this might be a, a more affordable way mm -hmm. if you're looking for that. It's true. Um, I bet there's a lot of good music from young or new composers that they know they're, they don't have a lot of experience. They don't have the same sort of credit to their name as others do. So 
they deliberately they're able to price their music very cheap um but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad quality right. music but they just make it cheap because they know that well no one's going to look at my name and immediately know oh this is probably going to be good mm -hmm. <laughs> so um it might take a little bit you, you definitely have to explore because there's such a huge variety but it might be a fun thing to do if you have some time on your hands and find something new to do okay so this is more choir specific um but these are two resources that i resources that i have used um within like student teaching and um last year and i will definitely continue to use these um i purchased these at tcda but you can definitely find them like on these websites on these publishing websites and everything so um the first one is warming up with rounds teaching music literacy using rounds and the choral rehearsal this is by katherine delanois um, and you can probably find it um, on Leonard's website um, and maybe even on Amazon. I don't know. But this is um, just filled with little rounds that you can teach um, your class. That they go from beginner all the way to um, advanced. So you can use this for your sixth grade beginning choir all the way up to your advanced choirs. Um, I'm definitely going to be using this book within like the first two weeks of school um, because I'm trying to prioritize um, uh, building classroom culture and the structure and everything um, within those first two weeks, but there still needs to be some singing going on. Um, and so picking one of these rounds um, that you think they'll like and teaching it within the first couple of weeks, um, I think um, that'll get them used to singing. And um, also it's just not like intimidating for them. You know, they just think that they're just learning something for fun and not like for a concert. Um, so this will be fun for you and for your students. Um, the next one is Quick Starts for Young Choirs. Th this is um, Activities and Ideas to Focus Young Singers. This is by Christy Carey Miller and Angela K. McKenna. Um, this is also on Helena's website, and you could probably find it on Amazon. So this one just has, um, it has little songs in there, um, similar to the Warm Up, warm up with Rounds. Um, but it also has like little games in there. Um, let's see. One that I used a lot it was like called Poison Rhythm or Poison or it was like, oh, what's it called? So, so Lamy. And so, um, I'm not going to go, th I'm not going to like describe it all, but they're just different, um, games in there that, um, are fun. Oh, there's Trash Get Ball. That one's always a fun one. Love Trash Get Ball. Um, that kind of bridge the gap between, you know, having fun and also learning music um, and music literacy, literacy skills. Um, so I would definitely recommend those two books. Um, these are the two books that I will be using the most within like maybe the first six weeks of school. Um, and then there are two people, well, yeah, two people that really, really helped me um, this past year that I found about, um, was Jody Coke. Um, she has a, um, website, teachers by teachers, Instagram, all called the choir queen. Now I don't know Jody personally, but, um, she's helped me a lot with her resources and advice to new teachers, veteran teachers. Um, she has so many different resources. Um, like, the main thing that helped me last year was she had like a little teachers pay teachers things about how to prepare for UIL, breaking it down from um, just like the whole timeline, like this, th these weeks you work on this, then you do this, then you do this. So it was really nice to have it all kind of laid out like, okay, this is what I need to focus on right now. And I think that really helped me and eased my anxiety a lot with um preparing my students for UIL um and she has different things like that and I, I believe she's coming out with a course um within cool. the next month or so um kind of breaking down your whole entire school year so I'm definitely gonna buy that <laughs> um and then Clinton Hardy he just um launched like a whole website and stuff like that I think it's called choir with Clint I believe um, he has a Facebook page um, and, and I believe an Instagram teachers pay teachers I haven't used it because it literally last week just launched 
but um, they have a podcast together called The Choir Chronicles that came out on July 4th of this past year, and they have a few episodes out, and I've already learned so much, and they're just a really, really good resource for you if you are lost or if you are new um, or looking for a new way of teaching your students. Yeah, and they're primarily focused on middle school choir yes. as well. Now, a lot of that's still applicable to high yeah, school, but um, just so you all know, it is, it is primarily middle school choir focused. Okay, and then we have one more left on this list. Yes, this is a more of a shorter episode. Uh, and so this is the last thing we have on the list, but I think it is the, I think we can agree, this is the most important yes. thing that you could have this podcast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond the measure. Beyond the measure. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine? That's all like, right. See you guys all next right, week. See y'all later. <laughs> this is literally the number one resource out of anything. <laughs> it's the most important. <laughs> well, we do hope this has been helpful, but uh, actually this does kind of, you know, our podcast does kind of have to do with this last one, uh, this last point. In all seriousness, it is other teachers. Mm-hmm. You, you can't get better than that. Right. Other people that are teaching, that have taught, that have the experience, you can learn from them. And I mean, a lot of this, a lot of the things on this list that we have came, we, yeah. came from other teachers. Yes. And we found out about them from other teachers. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, they are going to be your biggest resource. Um, majority of our episodes, maybe even every episode we've, we've done so far. Our guest, no matter who it is, has emphasized the importance of asking other teachers, what do you do? Um, And, you know, what can I learn from you? So that's one of the biggest things of all. Yeah. And um, I'll say, um, you know, my previous district, I didn't have that. Um, I didn't have that community of who who do I I didn't have anybody to talk to. And the music side. The music side of things. Yes. Um, I mean, it's just me and I've. And one band director in our schedules just never aligned, you know, um, although she was always willing to help me whenever I could see her. Yeah. Um, but now that I'm in a bigger district now, um, I haven't even started, but this past week I've had two meetings with, um, my, the high school director that, um, my middle school will be feeding into along with, um, the other middle school that will be feeding into that high school um we all had a meeting and sat down like okay what do we need it just like what do we need to do what um what do we want our students to continue on to high school and stuff like that um and then yesterday we had a meeting with all of the directors and the choir directors um in our district and you know, a lot of it was business, but um, there was times where we did ask, you know, advice, and it was just really, really nice to have that um, community and to feel supported, and I think almost every single one of them said yesterday, like, we need to lean on each other. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's one success at one campus, that is a success for all of us, and, um, you know, that's I just love that. And we're trying to plan on maybe once a week, maybe once a month, trying to get together for not just business purposes, but you know, it's always good to have that community. Like after a long week of school, going to these people and just venting about your day like that. That's so important. Um, So yes, other teachers, I think is the best um, resource of all. Yeah. And, Going off of that, remember that you are the average of the five people you hang out with the most. Mm. Um, that goes for in general, but you can also kind of divide that into like the work area. So how about the five teachers you hang out with the most? Yes, You're the average true. of those. Um, and so, and, and but, but then I should also say, maybe someone is in a similar position like you were Kara last year where maybe it's, it's hard for you to find that community. Well, even if that's the case, join a Facebook group 
uh, online or a forum or something, or listen to a podcast like ours or like Clinton Jody's, where you can hear from other educators that have been in your exact same shoes uh, at some point, and so that you can still learn from them. And so I'd go even as far to say you, you I mean, you are the average of the five people you listen to mm -hmm. the most. You know, uh, you know, through uh, different resources like this or YouTube videos and things like that. So by whatever sort of medium it is. Um, you just want to be sure to surround yourself with what you want to become. Yes, that's oh. very good. Yeah, I'll always remember. I, I don't know why <laughs> I still remember this, but it it was one of those uh, typical like posters you'd always see hung up in a classroom, and it was like my algebra class in high school, and it was a picture of like a bunch of really tall, sharpened color pencils, and then like one shorter, not as sharp pencil, like right in the middle. And, and, and it said, and they were all lined up and there was a short one, like right in the middle. And it just said, surround yourself with what you want to become. <laughs> and, it was, and it's one of those, one of those posters where it's like, oh, that's funny. But then it was actually like, oh yeah, that's actually really good. And so now I always think of that image, but it's so true. You want to surround yourself with what you want to become. Iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. As iron sharpens iron, uh, one man sharpens another. Yes. So, yep, Exactly. So, and that can go for better or worse. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. you know, if you surround yourself with good influences, that's, that's a good thing. And, and for bad, uh, not so much, but we're getting into all the philosophical talk now. So, <laughs> I think we should call it. all right. Yeah. So that is our full list. Uh, not a super long one. Obviously there are way more resources that, um, that, you have at your disposal uh, again let us know uh, if yeah. there are any that you recommend maybe we'll do another episode like this in a year uh, when the next school year is getting ready to start uh, but we hope that this helped or at least gave you ideas on where you could start looking for other resources or made you think oh man it'd be really nice to have a tool that would help me with this uh, so then you can at least start going on that path and looking for a solution so all righty well that's it for this week um I know most of us are kind of back in the grind. Um, if you've started school, like I'm about to start um, all the professional development stuff leading into this um, um, on Tuesday. Um, so if you're doing that, good luck. And if you are starting with your students, good luck. Have a great, great school year. Um, we're going to have another episode next week of course before I start um, and so I might have some more words of encouragement for you but just hang in there um, and I feel like this is going to be a better year for all of us yeah we're I mean it kind of depends on where you live but I think most of us it feels like we are exiting the COVID era um, obviously we're still feeling the effects in many ways mm -hmm. but at least we're not having to directly deal with it in like we'd had to a couple years ago. Yeah. So keep that as an encouragement. All right. Thank you all very much for listening. See you next week. Bye.